118 billion shillings to bridge the budget deficit. Questions are around whether this economic roadmap will truly be suffering by Kenyans, not only the Kenyan taxpayer, in terms of creating jobs, lowering the cost of living, and lifting barriers to investment. We'll be interrogating some of the tax proposals and the estimates around the 2023-2024 financial year. I'm joined by two gentlemen and one lady. Allow me to reintroduce them once again, just in case you're just joining us. Professor Exen Iraqi is joining us from the School of Business at the University of Nairobi a well-known economist, Asante Sana for your time and Thank Karibu you. to the round table. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Equally joined by Odhiambo Ramogi, who's the CEO of LM Capital and an economist. Thanks for your time and Karibu Sana, it's great to see you. Thank you. Well, thanks for your time and equally joined by Diana Gishengo, who is the national coordinator at the Institute for Social Accountability. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Karibu Sana. Uh, first of all, perhaps just to just the gentlemen in the room, happy Father's Day. Even as we <laughs> talk about the economics of the country, we won't forget to give credit where it's due. So. And a happy Father's Day to you too. Aspiring Father. Aspiring Father. Aspiring father. Aspiring father. We should, yeah. start, we should uh, start by talking about the economics of fatherhood. <laughs> <laughs> well, another time, another day. We are simply here to discuss matters to do with the country. And I'll start at that particular note. We we saw a lot happening on the floor of the House uh, just last week, Thursday, the CS Treasury breaking down some of the estimates all to do with the financial year that's set to start July 1st. Some of the big winners, we saw education receiving 630 billion, health allocation doubling to 30 billion, 250 billion allocated to road construction, I'm just mentioning some of the winners, 5 billion to fertilizer subsidy program, Hustlers Fund receiving an additional 10 billion to support the entrepreneurial behaviors, just to highlight some of the winners in the budget. So I'll start with you, Prof, your reflection of the budget statement that was read in Parliament. Is it a Hustlers budget? That's a hard question because the term Hustler is new. For the last nine months, the new government has been learning somebody else's budget. They inherited a budget from President Uhuru Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. So from July 1st, they have a chance now to run their own budget. So when I look at this budget, I see there is something for everybody. There's something for the employees, there's something for the employers, there's something for the hustlers. The only way I see it as a hustler's budget is because the hustlers got an enhanced fund. But beyond that, we are yet to see how the hustlers are going to benefit. When I look at this budget, it was not a very radical shift from the area budgets. Whether you look at the figures, whether you look at the allocation to various uh, departments and ministries, it seems to have been an incremental budget instead of being a, revo a revolutionary budget. So we can wait and see until it is implemented. Okay. Then at the end of the year or two years, the hustlers can tell us this is how the budget has uplifted me. This is how I've been, I have benefited from this budget. But for now, beyond the household as far, it looks like a very ordinary budget. Okay, interesting. Ramogi, as you come in, it's out with the big four agenda, in with the bottom-up economic transformation agenda. What do you make in terms of the winners and the losers in this budget? Are the noble provisions in the budget evident? Well, I agree with Prof on some things and on, on some things I don't. Um, for instance, I, am, I have made noise, I think, in this country for many years that we increase our allocation in the agriculture sector. And for me, I think that makes sense because if we invest in agriculture, it means then that we are on the path to food security. It means we are going to manage inflation. It means we are going to manage the forex uh, instability. Um, it, it means then we are going to create employment at the grassroots at a wide area level. Um, if you look at this budget, I think there has been significant improvement in terms of agricultural uh, allocation to the agricultural sector. The, the other thing I think that I'm also happy about that I can say, well, uh, probably uh, I hoped for more, but I got is the 
elimination of the tax on uh, gas, LPG gas. I think that is something to, to, to celebrate about. And, and I think at this point now I can agree with Prof. There is nothing else <laughs> to, <laughs> to write home about beyond that. But this he should be saying that the, the VAT for petroleum also went up. Uh, the VAT for petroleum went up, and, and, and now is bringing that up. Uh, if I was to be perhaps at a point where we are having discussions, where are we going to get the money? I'd probably say push it up. Push the VAT on petroleum up to perhaps the level where everything else is. Okay. But I would propose reduce the actual VAT on everything to 14%. Because then that will now start to ease resources in the economy, as opposed to pushing everything to 16%, when I think the bigger challenge is not on the rate, the bigger challenge is in our efficiency levels in collection. So pretty much, yeah, I would have said it is time to increase, the, to increase it, but just bring, it, bring the whole VAT to 14%, and maybe at a future level even bring it lower, because I feel that a higher VAT is going to deny this government um, the more, the higher revenue allocation that they are actually angling for. Okay, interesting. I'll get to interrogate that point. But Dan, as you come in, your observation of the budget estimates, did it speak to promoting equity, fairness, in terms of financing the national budget? Uh, what say you about the plight of the middle class as well? Wow, um, you've placed the middle class on me, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the first Kenya Kwanza budget yeah. um, is an interesting one. And um, based on, I, I would echo what Prof has said, I really expected a different budget based on the, all, the, all that we've had from them. Uh, we are going to change our, the philosophy, economic, political, everything to be bottom up. So I expected a major shift in, in that particular sense. But even as we say the middle class um, is going to be significantly taxed. And in, in, in every sense, um, away from the budget, think about what is happening in the health sector for the middle class. They have to pay more NHIF without guarantee that they will access public health services. In the education sector as well, there is a definition of people who are supposed to be in the health sector is, um, the, the, what's the name, Indi? In, indigenous. Mm -hmm. And in the education sector is vulnerable. The vulnerable ones are getting bursaries and have a higher priority when it comes to help. Then the middle class has to pay the full amount um, of school fees. Mm -hmm. um, again, they will now pay I am hesitant to say VAT is already at 16 because I am a believer we are still in the last week. The finance bill is yet <laughs> to pass. <laughs> so I'd like to allow the process to go to um, the, the full end. Okay. But I think um, this particular budget has the opportunity of pushing some middle class um, further up to the upper class. They may become the ones who are building these hospitals that are supposed to be exempt. There is, I, I, I also view it as a top-up budget as opposed to a bottom-up because in the guise of saying that we want to ensure that the economy is thriving, there is a protection of the capital class in this particular budget significantly. Um, and in that sense, I don't view it as a hustler, hustler bottom bottom up no it is a top up um, budget and um, in that sense a few middle class may jump up and a significant will jump will slide down interesting prof what's your take on the plight of the middle class even as you come in the question is uh, who is the middle class because in the last uh, few years we have talked so much about the hustlers mm. and we seem to know to have a very good idea of who is a hustler and then uh, we should be asking who is the middle class what are their characteristics? What is, this, what is their income? But we seem to define the middle, in, the middle income or the middle class for this purpose as people who can be able to afford a certain type of lifestyle. Uh, I guess he's a middle class. You can afford a car. You can uh, 
take your kids maybe to private school. You can go to the supermarket for shopping. But I think this budget, uh, if we look at it, has really uh, not be, been very fair to the middle class because most of the so-called middle class, from our definition, have a salary. And if you look at the budget, that is where the tax, pass, the tax man is targeting. You are talking about housing levy, enhances his health, NSSF, and if you earn more money, 35%, if you are in the upper bud, or 32%, 32 and so on. Mm -hmm. So it seems that at the end of the day, the budget or the tax man here is that the middle class has a very reliable income, which we can easily target. So let's put more tax on it. So in, in, the, in the medium term, the middle class is going to suffer loss of purchasing power because a lot of money is going to be taken by the taxman. But it is interesting that uh, it is also important to observe that in addition to getting money from the, ta from the middle class, the taxman also looked at the hustlers. Because if you look at uh, the bad at which you start paying the turnover tax, it has been enhanced so that more people can pay taxes. So in addition to getting money from the so-called middle class, we're also getting money from the hustlers in terms of making sure that more people pay taxes. But the middle class is probably, uh, I am hoping that in the long run we are going to have a, she says we are going to have a bigger middle class, but my worry is that it might end up shrinking. <coughs> so we need to give the middle class some enhancement, some incentives, so that they expand, they go up to what she, told, she talked about, the upper class. Then as we go to the upper class, like him, then we have more hustlers coming to the middle class. So that in the next few years, we have very few hustlers in this country. Everybody becomes rich. To quote Deng Xiaoping, being rich is glorious. That's what we are looking forward to. Okay, interesting. Ramogi. I know um, you disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> Even as you add your voice to that, because the... The situation on the ground is the government right now is under pressure to deliver on its elaborate manifesto. On the government side, they've said they need more time in order for their programs to have an elaborate effect on the masses. Question is, does a budget strike in terms of a balance in order to achieve, you know, public debt sustainability on one side and economic inclusion on the other? Now, those are very good questions. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to of comment course, yes, on the yeah. middle class uh, discussion. No, I, I would say that uh, if we can work on formalizing the micro and small enterprises, because there's a lot of uh, money that is already being generated there, but it is, it is unstable. It's too sensitive to shocks. Mm -hmm. So formalization will at least enable them to overcome some of the shocks because that would now give them access to insurance and proper financial services. And then that, that whole bulk of around, say, eight, nine million Kenyans who are in that sector, if we can pull them into the middle class, you know, I think that would be very successful. That would make a difference in the middle class in the country. And, and, and then now you can tax them. But you, you, we cannot focus our tax policies on 2 million people in the formal uh, sector and ignore these nine people who actually have the potential of pushing up our economy. You, you asked a very uh, important question uh, about the budget uh, as to whether it will, is it balanced enough to manage the issue of debt and also to bring in the issue of inclusion. Uh, on the inclusion side, I think the, the government is already trying to uh, come out of the, you know, the social and welfare policies that were there previously uh, because they are saying we do not want to create a welfare state. And so you find that a lot of the funds that were there to help the youth the women and the elderly are, are being, you know, tri trimmed, as it were, and more of the resources being channeled towards Hustler Fund. That should tell you that uh, inclusion is not part of the agenda uh, significantly. <clears throat> but on, on, on the side of public debt, you know, the budget is actually 4.4 trillion, eh? Uh, because the consolidated fund is not included in the 3.69. Eh? So if we are now talking about 4.4 trillion and the money that we are expecting is around uh, 2.9, eh? because we have the 2.5 from KRA, uh, revenue, ordinary revenue, 
And then we have the 300 billion in, in form of appropriations in aid. That's money charged by government agencies, etc. And so that's around 2.9 uh, trillion. In principle, then, our deficit is not just the 712 that uh, you are going to say we are going to borrow for the development expenditure. Our uh, deficit is, in fact, 1.5 trillion because no one has demonstrated to me where we are going to get the money to pay the debts uh, that are actually within the consolidated fund. Because you know that is usually not included in the, in the major budget. So now, with that reality, uh, and you will remember that uh, our, our debt ceiling is around 10 trillion and we're already at 9.6. So we have a, a, a balance of 400 billion to work with. Mm -hmm. In a reality where the forex is fluctuating uh, faster than a leaf in the hammer So that tells you then that um, we are already at a crisis. We are looking at a potential crisis and already are at a crisis because we need 712 for development expenditure, but we only can borrow 400 billion. And even this 400 billion will be eaten by the fluctuation in the, in the, in, in the forex. So we probably have room for 200 billion. And then we also have to pay the other debts, which we have not been told how we are going to pay uh, by uh, the budget that has been read. And so we have a debt crisis that has not been effectively addressed by the budget as read on Thursday by the minister by the cabinet secretary. So it doesn't strike a balance from where you sit? It doesn't strike okay. a balance at all. Interesting. As you come in, what's your take on it striking a balance? Economic inclusivity on the other side, managing the public debt issue. Um, let me start with the public debt issue. And um, overall, we, we do have a deficit. Mm -hmm. um, the, the 718 billion and we were told it's been reduced from 800 billion. But how was it reduced? We just decided to be more dreamy and imagine we will raise revenue, okay? Mm -hmm. Against a real, uh, 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 trends and projections that show clearly uh, we've not been hitting those targets, a very ambitious process. And the same, same problem has been carried to counties. Counties work on their budgets, and they also project they will collect a lot of own source revenue. With that, then, it's okay to pass an ambitious budget. Just based on that fact alone, and that we continue to grow our national budget, not reducing expenditure in any way, I'm just imagining we will collect more money at a time when um, we are in a fiscal consolidation. We are not doing anything to address debt. We are growing debt. We are growing debt for sure, and it has already um, had very serious ramification on both um, the economy as a whole and also on, on delivery of government um, services. Mm -hmm. So um, I recall during, on, the, on the budget reading day, I, I had hoped that professor would um, explain to Kenyans when he said um, that he's very serious about um, debt and whereas there, there will be a shift uh, from the ceiling to anchoring it in GDP, it was not clear what the, the, exact, the exact measures that government is going to take moving forward. Okay. For me, ultimately, it is the expenditure. How do we close the leakages? Corruption ought to have uh, been, been addressed very, very uh, prominently in this particular process. But all we are hearing is the fiscal consolidation measures that have been proposed by Bretton Woods um, Institution. Will this budget uh, spur economic growth? I am not very sure. I'm not um, very, very sure because it feels like um, there is this assumption that welfare regime, uh, social protection, those programs have, not take, have never taken the bulk of our budget. Mm -hmm. When you look at um, social spending and those sectors, we've never reached the required um, threshold. 
it may look like there's an increase in um, health allocation, um, education is at, as a, it's not yet where it ought to be. Health is still way, way, way below the required threshold. And this particular budget, even as we imagine a few industries will come, how many people can be absorbed in those industries? What will happen to the rest of Kenyans who rely on um, county and national government jobs, who rely on public services? So what are we saying? That people will be rich and all of us will become middle class. That way we don't need public schools. We don't need um, hospitals and things like that. Um, I, I have no confidence whatsoever that we are likely to see economic growth. And with the aggressive and punitive tax measures, um, I actually see the opposite. Mm. A regression because most companies that ought to be giving people either jobs or credits will not invest as much. They have to retain their profits. So they'll cut back a lot um, on expenditure and things like that. So I, I am not an economist, but I am a humanist. Uh, from a humanist <laughs> angle, I don't think um, this is a very good budget for economic growth. And before we bring in the economist, you brought up an issue about KRA and, of course, missing its target. Mm. Uh, this time round, it's supposed to collect 2.57 trillion thereabout, which is 17% more than the 2.1 trillion shillings in this financial year that's ending June. We've seen a couple of changes instituted at the Revenue Authority even though it's an ambitious you know, budget in terms of funding it, do you think these changes that have been instituted, new systems at KRA, new individuals, even as the president has spoken to increased targets, do you think this will actually surmount to you know, what KRA is supposed to do, meet a target at the end of the day? Um, again, I wish those efforts were directed at debt, auditing our debt, because that's a bigger pain than the amount of revenue we must collect. I, I also wish that those efforts were directed at all the misplaced expenditures that we see with government. Definitely, um, this, the, the finance bill proposes um, measures to streamline tax collection, make administration easier, that's a positive thing. Yeah. And hopefully it will make, um, it will grow. But it can't, it can't cause that leap that is expected. The, the other thing, uh, particularly for the informal traders um, and the invoicing system, the KRA has not been able to collect as much as they should from informal traders. Why? Because of um, the, the invoice ma machine, it's called ETIM. It's very expensive. So that would have been an area of um, reform. But look at um, world over. Whenever there is such microaggression around taxation, what happens? Revenue just goes down. It doesn't matter how effective it is. Um, you will go down to the Boda Boda and the Mamamboga, you will bring all these supervisors. Soon we will see physical wars because you cannot, you're not able to feed yourself. You're expected to pay a certain tax within a very, very short period. Surely you want me to pay tax and my family dies? No, there will be a natural negative resistance. You do not want to do that. Pay tax. Payment of taxes must remain um, a duty and a responsibility you take up proudly, but not one uh, that feels like somebody is exca excavating your tooth. Um, it shouldn't be that painful. Okay. Prof, as you come in and add your voice to uh, the question of balance, a lot of comparison has been brought up in terms of Ruto's approach towards financing the budget in comparison to what Kibaki did during his administration in 2002 as he picked up. Are there any similarities in terms of approach? Because we've heard from the president even yesterday that he's saying, I won't go down the route of borrowing. We have to tax in order to finance. 
and that's what happened during Kibaki era. What exactly is the comparison between these two eras? Maybe before I respond to them, let me respond to your question. Because if you remember, in around last year when we were campaigning to, to get the next government, mm -hmm. everybody seems to be alluding to Kibaki, which clearly shows that our economy enjoyed a very good time. Mm. And one of the big questions I've been having in the last nine months is why have, have we not benefited from, from the, good, the feel good effect? Because any time you marry, you enjoy the first few months of marriage. I don't know whether you are married or of you. <laughs> the honeymoon and so on. Mm -hmm. So we expected the new government to make us feel good. There's change. There's something happening. But now there's a lot of groom. So if you remember the reason why Kibaki's government did so well, it was not because he did something very special. It's because we felt good. We are very optimistic. We <coughs> actually voted as the most optimistic people in the world after 2002 polls. So if the government could now make us feel good about ourselves, would consume more, would invest, invest more, would work longer hours. Would what do you con mean by feeling good about feeling good, good will. Feeling good is just that. It's an economic term to feel good. Okay. But we have a new government. Mm -hmm. We have voted. So we are feeling very optimistic about the future. But when you talk to the people on the streets now, they are very gloomy. They are very sulky. And that's why even on the day the budget was being read, people are not very, very excited about it. Yeah. So if you look at the conversation we are having here and on the streets and elsewhere, it's about taxes, about how life is becoming hard, not how life can become better. So that feel-good effect is what is missing. And I think the government and its policy makers and its PR should make us feel good about ourselves. As I said earlier, we are going to consume more, we are going to invest more. So that feel-good effect, in my opinion, is what is missing, so that we can say this is what Kibaki did. If you talk to anybody during Kibaki era, people say there was a lot of money. Where was that money coming from? Just because people are, people are working harder, they were feeling good. So th if Kenyans can start feeling good about themselves, about the government, about their families, about their country, there's no reason why they're not going to be more productive. There's no reason why we are going to raise more taxes. Now, if I can, can go back to what my fellow panelists talked about, inclusion. You remove subsidies. That's one thing that the government has done. We are going to remove subsidies. And subsidies usually brings the people on the lower bottom, lower edge, lower the, the bottom up. We, we take care of the people at the bottom with subsidies, but you're removing them. But also we are taking care of the elderly and the people with the disabilities. So I think the government is trying to bring some inclusion, but it is taking with this hard, removing that hard. On the pub, public debt, that's the most interesting one. Because my colleagues forgot to say that debt, a very important debt that we always forget to talk about is unpaid bills. Mm. If you talk to the people in the counties and elsewhere, there's a lot of bills that the government has not paid to them. I think the last time I heard was about 900 billion. 700. 700. Yeah. And that, that should be, any time we discuss about bills, or we talk about bills, that should be included. Mm -hmm. And then he said that we are almost hitting the 10 trillion Kenyan shillings. Uh, Selling. Yeah. But the government has come up with an alternative. She talked about it. Mm -hmm. Now define your debt as, the debt ceiling as a percentage of GDP. Debt divided by GDP. And that is a more flexible way of, is a more flexible ceiling than an absolute figure. And uh, the CS, when he was, he was reading the budget, alluded to that. I don't know that it's going to be 60% or, or, or whatever it is. <coughs> the good thing about the new way to define the budget, uh, the, budget the, 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 debt the debt ceiling, yeah. and I support it, is that for you to get more debt, you need to grow the economy. So if you say your debt ceiling is 60% of the GDP, then if you want to, to raise it, then you must increase the GDP. You must grow the economy. And I'm hoping our leaders and policymakers will, will take that obligation to make sure that the small and micro enterprises, the big companies and so on, have a very conducive environment to grow. So if the economy grows, then we have more taxes. We are happy. We feel good about ourselves. Now, the other thing I need to mention is, there was a lot of mention by the, by the CS about PP, public-private partnership. And to me, I think that's one way to reduce the effect of the budget deficit. So that if the, the, pub, the private sector is taking some of the government projects, then we reduce the, the pressure on the government finances, which I think is a good way to deal with the issue. And finally, when you talk about borrowing, I saw something this week about borrowing. One of the boards was auctioned, and I think at around 16% interest rate. And then uh, the subscription was about 367%. The infrastructure bond. Yes. So that clearly shows that people have money. 
but they want somebody to give them an incentive to give the government money. And to me, that's a big problem because you are saying we don't want to borrow, but if you want to borrow, people are willing to give you money at a high interest rate. And from an economic point of view, if the interest goes up, you depress the economy because people, the economy becomes more costly. People find it harder to borrow money. They are going to pay, to pay higher interest rate and they don't invest. So, so, so I think all in all, we have not done enough balancing in terms of the budget. But back to Kibaki, he showed us how to pay taxes to Kajibuni Akuam Kenya. So if we are, for example, being made to feel good that you are paying taxes, okay. I'm sure we'll pay more taxes. We're not having a problem. And finally, let's also know where this tax is going. So Accountability. That, yes. Problem. Once we know where that tax is, is going, people will pay taxes without any problem, including Ramogi here. <laughs> Speaking of Ramogi, <laughs> even as you come in, the messaging from the government has painted a scenario where they seem to have taken the lesser evil, increasing mm -hmm. taxes as opposed to high intensive borrowing. So looking at the finance bill and some of the changes that were instituted onto the proposals and the clauses here and there, is the finance bill a less tougher pill to swallow for the Kenyan taxpayer? We now house, we have a housing tax, which is no longer a levy. We hear that it's at 1.5%. There are no paybacks. Equally, a couple of changes around withholding tax on income from digital um, content creation at 5% down from 15%. Well, what do you make of some of the changes around the finance bill? No. <clears throat> <laughs> First of all, I don't know whether to start with the uh, prof, uh, yeah, yeah. especially on the debt ceiling prof. Now the one you are saying is even worse. Because we are already at 76% as at now, before we borrow the 400 or the 700 or the 1.5 trillion, or the extra 700 billion for unpaid bills, which will even push it to now 2.2 trillion. If then we say that we are going uh, with the GDP, uh, that debt to GDP ratio, we are already at 76%. Uh, Prof, the cabinet secretary, is proposing 55. Is it 60 or 55? I am not sure. 55, 55. thereabouts, yeah? Now, in principle, we have already exceeded his limit by 21%. So even if his finance bill is approved, 100% even with the opposition MPs, he still have a crisis in his hands. Because first of all, the first thing he needs to do when that finance bill is approved with that proposal is find ways and means of reducing that figure to 55% so that he are there with the, with the rule of law. But the second problem also with the, with the and, 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 and I think we've had this discussion, the problem with the debt ceiling is that they are placebo. Government will not ex seek to uh, expand the economy merely on account that you said because it is a percentage of GDP. That is the ideal. The reality is that government looks at the problem here and now. How do we solve it? We borrow. We go to parliament. We tell parliament we want money. And then parliament is forced because parliament is a political institution. They don't want to look like they are the ones hindering the development of Kenya. So they are forced to make adjustments and, and to play to the whims of the institute, of, uh, of government or, or, or treasury. And so I am still not very warm towards even this uh, as a percentage. For me, I think the real issue is how do we expand our, expand our economy so that then we, even as we talk about debt, it is already too low because the economy has expanded significantly. Back to the question which you asked, is the, gov is the finance bill a less tough pill to swallow as opposed to debt? It would have been. It's just that, you know the challenge we have with the administration as of now is they have awesome ideas, but the way they implement them just leaves you wondering, Kwani, what were you thinking? I, I had tried to make a list of just all the taxes that have been uh, incorporated now. We have VAT on fuel. We have the housing tax, which now uh, Parliament has said is a tax, uh, human energy savings, which is even worse because initially it was a savings after seven years, you can access it. Now 
it's it's a tax. Imenda, imenda. No refunds. No refunds. <laughs> and then there is no limit. You know, the other one, at least there was a limit of 2,500. This one, it can go up to 15,000 of your money. There's no... So it, it is worse, even though it is lower, but it is... It is worse than we have the NHIF increment that has gone up. We have the digital tax. We have turnover tax. We have levy to sugar, which the, the, the cabinet secretary brought at the final minute <laughs> as a surprise to sweeten <laughs> the, the finance bill deal, as it were. Okay. And so then you find that these taxes are just too many and too minute and, and just all over the place. Mm -hmm. One of the things that this administration came in and promised us was that they are going to reduce some of these taxes that are actually overburdening Kenyans. And the cabinet secretary identified it as one of the things that they were asked by Kenyans to do. But they are doing quite the contrary. Because we wanted a finance bill that will ensure that we have a tax sustainability on one hand, but also we increase our collection. Because even though we are saying that, yes, we need to expand the economy so that then uh, the, ta the, uh, the tax to GDP is also improved, our tax to GDP is still low. And that is a reality that we need to face. And so to increase it, you don't increase the rates. You increase the efficiency. You increase, you, you find out which is the optimum place where we can actually get the most tax, uh, the, most, the most revenue. You work around it and you find that we have not succeeded in doing that, whether with the finance bill or the appropriations bill as tabled in parliament today. So yes, I would imagine that tax, um, having a sustainable tax framework would be the better pill compared to debt. But how it has been implemented leaves a lot to be desired. Dan, add your voice to that. A lot has been said about the finance bill, and we've seen the essence of public participation. A couple of changes were instituted by the committee around mm -hmm. the finance bill. Is it a less tough appeal to swallow? Um, let's start by acknowledging it is clearly a pill. <laughs> and there are very few... Um, it is not candy, it is appeal. It remains um, appeal and we have to try as much as possible, get water and, and swallow. Mm. Some of us will not be able to swallow it completely. But an, one, one of the things that is um, unfortunate is instituting such expansive tax measures before you inspire people to be confident that what, what, what you're proposing to shift from borrowing to more revenue collection is something doable, this is the right timing, that already for Kenya Kwanzaa, I feel they lost the plot. This should have been a time when they um, enforce the, the tax measures as they, as they were before, just ensure that more people who were not paying tax based on the previous bracket. Because like for the turnover, it is being increased from 1% to 3%, yeah. yet compliance has been very low. Why don't we attempt compliance at 1%? Then with time, when we have netted that particular group, we can later increase it, but no. But most importantly, um, this is the one year where Kenyans are now discussing the budget, both from the expenditure and the revenue yeah. mobilization side. Now, the other thing that is very clear, the purpose of the tax, how it is collected, purpose is not clear. When purpose is not clear, you can be sure you're headed for abuse. Abuse of resources, abuse of power. Mm -hmm. Think about the housing, levy, tax, um, fund, I don't know what it <laughs> is anymore. Yeah. This is the one thing um, I was shocked to see the cabinet secretary treasury still have in um, his budget speech. Because as a legislative proposal, what, it, what we participated, I took part in the public participation. I, I, my, my people were in KACC. I met the committee. But it, is, it has changed completely. 
we were not told it's a levy where it goes and we are out. It was supposed to be a chama where we contribute and some of us get houses, others save. At some point we may get interest, maybe not. It was also a way of bequeathing our children something through government. It has changed. When you change a legislative proposal, you must start afresh public participation. So what we have at second reading is very different from what was published initially. The sugar levy has been introduced. We all need to be healthy. Maybe I hear. Okay? <laughs> is this just a new research that emerged from nowhere? Uh, but definitely issues like uh, standardization of withholding tax for digital content creators, that's a welcome thing. Um, tax, taxation needs to be very, very well defined um, for us to be able to, the uniformity is welcome. I hope it is not bait so that digital content creators imagine they have better tax um, taxation, they are on a better regime. No, we all pay 5% withholding tax and thereafter we pay um, our full tax. Yeah, okay. So the finance bill um, remains problematic and I'm hoping that this week we will see members of parliament move several amendments to ensure that um, Kenyans are not um, sore, they are not in pain, that this bill, this bill, even the size, it should just, we, we should be able to slow it at the bare minimum. But let me speak to the issue of pending bill. And um, it's not even clear. 700 billion in the budget, it's about 532 billion. And then there's a proposal that we will have a task force. Before we pay, we will create a task force to analyze, do we have 532 pending bills? <laughs> Yet this is supposed to be paid as a priority. Why do we have a problem with pending bills at county and at national level? We, we have uh, the public procurement and regulatory authority. We are supposed to advertise everything. The budget is approved beginning of the year. Where is the problem? Parliament has had a, a discussion and said, the pending bills, for them to be paid, it will, will need a political dialogue. You know, another bipartisan process for pending bills. Things that are supposed to be very, very well accompanied by paperwork and, a, and a proof, proof yes. that work was done, mm -hmm. goods were delivered. Mm -hmm. What exactly happens with pending bills? You wake up every day and one governor says, I denounce all the previous pending <laughs> bills of the <laughs> former regime. Where is con gov continuity of government? Okay, okay. How do we, 532 billion and the budget is 3.6, 4.5, that's a very, very high percentage. Mm. It is um, the next avenue of corruption. What we have from the Auditor General, the controller of budget, should be adequate. Okay. If people don't have paperwork, please go and pursue your money elsewhere. But for us to continue entertaining extrajudicial measures, and I was particularly very perturbed when um, the CS said they are going to create a task force. We're just from Shakahola, where we have a judicial system, a investigatory bodies, where are we creating a tribunal? Don't we have faith in the institutions? What else will this particular task force do that is different other than maybe a political negotiation? Why are we negotiating accountability and transparency? Then we make Kenyans pay. Is this finance bill a political negotiation? No. We've been told we'll pay whether we die or... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, come yes. in and add your voice on that particularly. I'd like you to respond to this because... There are those who feel that the government has been deaf to the pleas to alleviate the cost of living. The Treasury CS highlighted, you know, that the cost of living is among the top priorities. And he said that in the short term, they've waived import duty on essential food items. In the long term, you know, increasing food production with fertilizer subsidy, whatnot. How effective is the government's approach around lowering the cost of living? That's, that's an interesting question, but let me first of all mention something very important. She raised and he also raised. Sure. This issue of unpaid bills worries me. Mm -hmm. 
because if you look at the economic definition of GDP, it is money times the velocity. Mm. So when you don't pay people their money, then you throw down the velocity of the money circulation and the economy slows down. So as we talk about how to make the economy grow bigger, then we need to have people pay their, people should be paid their money. Because when you don't pay me my money, if you pay me my money, I don't keep it in the pocket. I spend it and somebody else spend it and the economy benefits. So I don't know why people, there was, there was no task force when people were being given contracts and working. <laughs> so why are we having, why is, always, is it always an issue in this country to be paid your money, including myself and so on. So let's pay people their money, they will spend it, they will have the multiply effect, they can benefit. Yeah. So on the cost of living. You're also an unpaid supplier. Oh yeah, that's yeah. different, uh, but not at the <laughs> <laughs> but, but I am owed money by a lot of people. So the, the CS talked about the cost of living, which I think the opposition has really been very vocal about. Quite so. A lot of us are talking about the cost of living. Uh, if you go to the supermarket today and you compare with what you bought last year, there's a very big difference. Whether you talk about sugar, whether you talk about unga. Like yesterday, I was surprised to discover that, uh, and please uh, don't, don't forgive me because I realized that the price of maize flour is actually more than the price of wheat flour. Mm. So, which was a surprise to me. But when I talked to the hustlers, they gave me a very good explanation. Although I'm a semi-hustler, that if you buy unga and you want to cook your, your, your ugari, you just put hot water, you, you cook. But if you buy the cheaper chapati or the cheaper uh, unga yangano, then you have to think about using cooking oil, which is very expensive. So what appears cheap on the show is actually very expensive in the long run. Okay. So the, the CS say that one way to reduce the cost of living, or the cost of living one, is to import duty-free food and so on. And the other day I, I, I saw some guys being threatened that they have not been importing, <laughs> importing food fast enough. So that is uh, a short-term solution. Okay. The long-term solution to bring down the cost of living is one, to make sure it is always raining. The CS has no power. Because once it rains, then the cost of living goes down because food is a very big factor in inflation. Yeah. In the long run, we need to learn how to produce our food more efficiently. When I was a young boy, I always used to see extension officers coming to advise my, my father how to produce, how to make, how to have better, better sheep, better cows, better food, crops, and so on. Nowadays, I don't see them. So let's make farmers more productive. Unfortunately, when we think about production of crops in this country, we think too much about fertilizers. Yeah. Yet there are other factors that come in, okay. the technology that you use. All right. The cost of labor is very high. Yeah. So I think on that, the government has tried. So we need to look, look at the, the, in the, the short term and the long run. Okay. The, other, the other reason why the cost of living has been, go, has been going up, apart from uh, food, is you, you, you look at energy. Energy is a very big factor because we all go from point A to B when, when we are working in, in our factories, in our chambers, we all use, use some energy. Okay. And the government has said that uh, they are having a government-to-government -government, uh, program to import oil from the Middle East. And we have not seen that in terms of the price of petrol, the price of diesel and so on. Remember that we removed the subsidies. And then uh, because you have removed the subsidies and the VAT is going up, then the price of oil will go up by, by extension. So unless we look at the cost of food, we look at the cost of petroleum, then it's very hard to control the cost, the, the cost of living. If we, if we can tackle those two, All right. then we might be able to control that. But I don't okay. see that doing a lot. I don't see us doing that in the short run. Okay, interesting. And uh, due to time, we'll have to get the closing remarks. But Diana, I'd like you to respond to this even as you give us your final comments. Because we've seen Parliament uh, sort of play its role. On one end, we've seen some parliamentarians vote according to their conscience and defy the party lines. Uh, we've definitely seen now party leadership, you know, try crack down on errant members of parliament. When we bring governance into this particular conversation, is parliament still the people's representative with meaningful debate, oversight and legislation, or have they let down their guard? Um, that's an easy one. No, <laughs> parliament has let us down completely. Yeah. Now, and um, even since the new constitution, parliament was created um, under the new constitution as the most powerful institution. How they still uh, shiver, wobble, and imagine that they need to get powers from elsewhere, 
I get completely lost. But what to do when the president speaks stuff and says, I'm monitoring who will vote against this? That, that right there uh -huh. is the problem. Mm. And, and it's the reason why we are where we are. It is that they have been whipped before to pass irregular budget, to approve ceilings they don't believe in, to throw reason and only have a political fanatism. If there is an institution that Kenyans must focus on, it is parliament, through and through. Because um, the, the, both the budget, when they were given the opportunity to look, look out for austerity measures and so on, what did they do? They gave us a budget that was increased by 89 billion. How are they helping us? When the finance bill came, they made sure they even set aside their own rules of procedure and uh, reduce debate as much as possible. When the opposition um, raised a few points of orders, they quickly gave up as well. How they just walk out instead of occupying their space consistently in that house, parliament has let Kenyans down. And I hope this week they can wake up. I do not, sometimes I wish, I don't know whether we should just remove it because <laughs> after this work, for okay. those of us who are in the governance sector, okay. people will be expecting go to court. Why? Because parliament refused to do their job. Yeah, right. Okay? Yeah. And those members of parliament, because they know their constituents are suffering, they will be there advising you, look at the Hansard, we flouted this rule, <laughs> we flouted this other one. Surely, parliament... Mm. Parliament, Wabunge, okay. they have let us down. Okay. Imagine Senate voted against counties getting increased revenue for service delivery, for strengthening devolution. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you shoot yourself and then come cry that we need to give you first aid? Should we tell, is it time that Parliament just perishes? But it's such a critical institution. Quite I hope a number of people will rise up and um, this is a week to watch. Let's see whether they can <laughs> finally show their representatives of the people. We are no longer being guided by committees. We are now the full house. All those who had flown to different countries were attending barrios, things like that. <laughs> Let us see whether they will understand their work of legislation and representation. Yeah, this is a decisive week. Interesting. Ramogi, as you give us your final comment, uh, we've talked about prudent government spending and the controller of budget had an interesting report. She released a couple of insights around government spending and according to her, 2.1 trillion shillings is what the government spent Oh, out of 2.1 trillion shillings, the government spent 259 on development only. To add on that, government officials have gobbled up 14 billion in travel in the nine months ending just March this year. The highest in a similar period um, in at least five years. So how exactly do we control government wastage, prudent use of resources? This seems to be a new term within government. How do we ensure this is... I, can I at least start from parliament? Briefly. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly no, yeah. I, I, I just wanted to explain why parliament is behaving funny, mm -hmm. even though the constitution gives them power. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, every member of parliament has to think about election, okay. whether they will be re-elected. And unfortunately, he knows that he does not qualify to occupy the space he's occupying of his own accord. He needs the political <laughs> party. And the political party is either controlled from State House right. or controlled from the ODM, uh, from uh, Raila's uh, offices. And so because of that, then he has to play nicely. So that at that some Ramogi, point... that's not a political party. They, they never even last one election <laughs> cycle. <laughs> but that, that, that is, is the reasoning not. in Parliament. That is the reasoning in Parliament so that they know that if I am to survive because of his own accord, do call it look. political party. Do not, do not disabuse. Thank political you. parties, no. So, no. Prudent government spending. Yes. The problem is bigger than what it has been even mentioned. We, I was in a meeting, and I will not name uh, which meeting, where we were talking about domestic debt and how that 
the bulk of the domestic debt is being used in recurrent expenditure. Okay. Because it is not being used in uh, development uh, projects. What is being used in development projects is most or more often than not the foreign debt that we get. And so the problem is bigger because a lot of, of it cannot be explained. To date, we are paying Eurobond 1 and Eurobond 2. We still don't know what Eurobond 1 and 2 did. And so I, I think that. Uh, even though this government came on, and they are clear that the corruption is not a problem they are trying to solve. At least on that one, they are honest. Even though they came and said it's bottom up, I think that has, has been lost somewhere along the line. You said I can give my final, final chaukweli right. tax policy. Yeah. I think we really need to expedite putting in place a proper tax policy for this country that will help us against some of the things I am seeing, some of the trends I'm seeing in the finance bill 2023. Because if we had a proper tax policy, uh, some of the things we've seen would not be uh, a reality. Okay, well noted. Prof, final comment. I, I, if, if somebody was listening to this discussion from outer space, he might think that this is the first finance bill we've ever had. So, but we have been having finance bills all the time. But it is good that Kenyans have finally become homo economicus, not homo sapiens. <laughs> we are seeing economic issues in all things that we do. Mm -hmm. Which